Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Strides. Our guest today is Dr. Brooke Ellison, a brilliant neuroscientist whose work I have been following and greatly admire. So Dr. Ellison, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Addie. Um, so to start, um, I've been following your work for a couple years now, and those who have are familiar with your um, general background, but for those that aren't, would you mind just giving us a general background of sure. where you're from, your overall situation, and that sort of thing? Sure, of course, of course. Um, so um, I'm 42 years old, and uh, for the first uh, 11 years of my life, it was, I, I lived a life that's different than it is right now. So I grew up on Long Island, uh, in Stony Brook, Long Island, which is on the North Shore um, of Long Island. So Long Island kind of juts off the, the coast of New York. Um, and I was uh, walking home from my first day of seventh grade when I was 11. And uh, I was crossing a fairly major highway um, on Long Island, uh, Nichols Road. It kind of cuts the island almost in half north to south. And when I was uh, walking home from school, I was hit by a car. Um, and uh, that was a, a quite devastating event for me uh, as a child. Um, you know, I was in a child's body, so really not all that robust, but um, was thrown 100 feet in front of the car and I cracked my skull open, bit off part of my tongue, um, went into cardiac and pulmonary arrest. Um, and I uh, was taken to Stony Brook Hospital, which is, was really just right down the road. And th thankfully, that's where my accident took place. Um, if it weren't for that fact, then I probably would not have survived it. So uh, I was taken there, and there were a lot of questions about whether or not I would survive. Actually, it was likely that I was not going to survive. That was the information that my parents were given, uh, that, you know, to basically expect the worst, that your daughter um, would not survive and if she would survive that she likely wouldn't be able to communicate or do any of the things that she had been able to do before. Um, I spent a total of nine months in the hospital, uh, six weeks in pediatric intensive care and then seven and a half months in, in rehabilitation and um, I was in a coma for 36 hours and uh, emerged from a, the the coma and it became clear that I was going to survive, but it wasn't really clear what my life was going to be like. Um, so I spent those months kind of trying to um, re-understand myself, relearn how to live my life with a disability. Um, you know, when I was in rehabilitation, like I had to get stabilized at uh, the hospital in intensive care first, kind of just become more stable for transport. And then once I reached that point after six weeks, I was transferred to uh, Children's Specialized Hospital in New Jersey, uh, which is a rehabilitation center. And that's where I learned to, uh, to talk again. That's where I learned to um, drive a wheelchair, to activate technology, to really to, to be disabled. And um, when I returned home, the biggest concern of mine, kind of a promise that my family made to me was that they would make every effort to get me back into school so that I wouldn't be left back. I could be with my friends. And uh, that was a, uh, more of a struggle than we had expected it to be. There was some resistance that was met, but um, my, my family kind of forged ahead, tried our best to get things put into place, put pieces into place to, to make that a reality. And I returned to school exactly one year after the day of my accident. So my accident was in September of 1990, September 4th of 1990, and I returned to school on September 4th of 1991 um, with my classmates. And uh, from that point on, I've been focused on my education as my primary means to interact with the world, you know, to make a difference in the world. I knew that that was going to be the case. I knew that um, my life was going to be different and have to find the ways that I could to make a difference in the world. So I focused on my education as much as I could all the time that I had spent doing physical activities when I was a child, I rerouted to, um, you know, to my education. So I uh, went back to, to school, you know, graduated from high school, went to Harvard where I did my undergraduate degree and also my master's degree in public policy. Um, went, uh, 
during that time, Christopher Reeve, uh, who is an actor uh, who also had sustained a spinal cord injury similar to my own and was also ventilator dependent. Uh, he he uh, made contact with me and asked if he could make a movie about my life. So he did that. We worked together on that, the Brooke Ellison story. And then um, uh, I went back to Harvard where I did my graduate degree in public policy and then came back to Long Island and ran for public office, which um, was quite an experience, quite a life altering experience. And then um, founded a nonprofit organization uh, to teach people about uh, science research, the importance of biomedical research. And I'm now a professor, professor at Stony Brook University. I got my PhD in, med in the sociology of science and uh, the ethics of science. And so I teach courses on medical ethics. I teach courses on health policy. Um, I teach courses on uh, social determinants of health and healthcare leadership and all things that you know have been very uh, integral in my life. And um, that's where I am right now. So, um, if you don't mind me saying that, Darlton, I know that your um, undergrad from Har Harvard focused mm -hmm. on cognitive science. Do you mm -hmm. think that um, your childhood is what contributed to that choice? Because obviously you had plenty of choices you could have made. Um, so when I, when I first got to, to college, when I first got to, to Harvard, I thought that I would probably just study um, psychology. And um, that was my intent. Uh, and then I, I broadened my thought a little bit. Um, there were several fields that, that kind of intersected with psychology and biology was one of them. So uh, cognitive neuroscience um, was a, a, a new discipline. It was called a mind-brain behavior track. And um, it, it focused not just on psychology, but also how our, um, how our bodies and minds are kind of connected, how our brains, um, how you know, neurons work and how our brains operate. A kind of a, a newly uh, explored field. So I broadened my interest from just psychology to psychology and biology and cognitive neuroscience as a result. And it had a lot to do with my own injury. Um, you know, I wanted to better understand how the nervous system worked. I wanted to understand, you know, what, what, um, you know, how a neuron may or may not repair itself after injury. I wanted to know um, about the nature of the nervous system in general. So that really was what dro drove my interest. Um. I have two more questions that I'd like to address. Mm -hmm. um, the first one, I noticed from your biography that you're on several boards all related to your scientific research mm -hmm. and your, you know, your social model of disability and, and that sort of thing. Obviously, these your credentials, you're in very high demand. So when you're asked to do this or asked to do that, how do you choose, okay, am I going to accept this offer or am I not? That sort of Oh, interesting question. It's interesting, yeah. So, so um, there's no doubt that um, yeah, my my schedule is pretty packed. Is yes, pretty um, is pretty tight. But I try to make room for the things that I think are important, and um, you know, I try to make I try to fill my time with as many personally enriching and socially enriching things as I possibly can, right? Like, I mean, I love to spend time with friends. I love to listen to music. I mean, in, in, in a, a pre-pandemic world and hopefully a post-pandemic world, yeah, I go to concerts, go to, you know, parties and see friends and stuff like that. And that's all, you know, extremely important to me. But at the same time, like when it really comes down to you, how I prioritize my schedule and the things that I that I do is, you know, I, I try to focus on the things that are going to have the biggest impact and make the biggest difference. So that's really why I kind of devote so much of my time to my work and kind of um, engaging in different speaking opportunities or talking to different groups of people because like I know that that is what matters and like I know that I've, I've had a real deep and rich 
set of circumstances and experiences in my life. And I think people can grow from that and learn from that. And if I can use my own experiences to help other people, and that's really what I, tr what I try to do. So anytime something like that comes my way, I try to take advantage of it, or I try to participate in it in whatever way that I can, because you know, I, I know that there are very few people who experience things like I have experienced, but at the same time, everybody is going through some kind of level of difficulty or challenge that we can learn from. And um, if I can share that, then that's really how I prioritize the things that I'm asked to do. And the last real thing that I want to touch on, I noticed that um, earlier this year, in the middle of all the craziness that's been going on, you started your own LLC. Now mm -hmm. I'm in the entrepreneurial world myself, so this is, that, you know, is very dear and near to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, as your business is so new, in a sense, where would you like to see it go? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so you, uh, you're absolutely right. So just um, over the course of the past few months, I founded uh, or I started a, um, an LLC, kind of a consulting uh, LLC, um, so that I could use my own knowledge and experiences to help guide the, the, um, the work and innovation that um, technologists and innovators are creating so that it's more inclusive of the lives and the needs of people with disabilities and then also at the same time to help um, people and organizations and groups of people learn to navigate difficulty in ways that are better um, than possibly they they might initially expect. Um, so you know, those are those are two different avenues that are very much couched in my own personal experiences and how I've lived my life. And, you know, I'd love to see that continue. I'd love to see that grow. Um, you know, I'd love to see that the work that, um, that I have done and, and the experiences that I've had help to shape the thinking of people at all different levels. Um, you know, whether that is uh, businesses or, um, you know, governments or organizations or anything like I, I, you know, I think that we all could benefit from and learn from some of the um, experiences that we all must inevitably face when it comes to navigating difficulty and when it comes to being more inclusive and in how we um, approach the world. So that's really what I, that's the vision that I have. Um, that's the, that's the goal, though, the end that I'm working towards. And uh, so far, it's been a lot of fun to see that happen. Yes. Um, before we wrap it up, is there anything you would like to address and or ask me that has not been addressed? Um, well, no, I just would like to thank you for being so visible, being so, um, so equally as intent on um, making a mark in the world. I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I think that many of us um, working together um, help to redefine how disability has typically been defined uh, in the world. And you know, it's good to have a, a partner in you, Addie. Want to go to my website or you'd, um, view any of the videos there or by uh, um, you join the mailing list or anything like that. Yeah, I love to keep in contact with people that way. Thank you. Thank you, Addie. You take care. Enjoy your afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>